reasonable fear, I think. Yeah, sorry. I have lots of fears. <laughs> yeah, let's list them in order. <laughs> what is this? Is this a bag that has a bag in it? I think it is. I like these kind of bags. I never use them, but I think they're really cool. These are the bags that I stuff in with all the bodega bags that I mean to reuse and never do. All right. That's fine. I, this, I, this is some good banner. That's fine. Uh, I'm gonna use it after. Yeah, but it's also. Um, I feel like right. there's so yeah. much distance between. Really far. You wanna move over? The UN. Yeah, come over a little bit. The camera is all you, though. Oh. <laughs> I better look like I'm paying attention the whole time. <laughs> can Can I ask everyone to be seated, please? We're, we'll We'll start in. We we'll start now. All right, good evening, everyone. My name is Sheila Coronel. I'm academic dean, for those of you who still don't know me. I'm academic dean of the journalism school here at Columbia. Tonight, we have our first Hearst Digital Media Lecture of the Year. We're going to have another one in the spring. Today's topic is, can journalism schools teach digital journalism instincts? So I guess that's a question for us, but for you students is, can you learn digital journalism instincts in a journalism school? We thank the Hearst Foundation for its general funding for this program. Each year, we bring to the J School a leader in the digital field, our Hearst Digital Media Professional in Residence. It's a unique opportunity for our students to interact with, with the leading professionals in that field. If you must know, this used to be called the Hearst New Media Professional in Residence, but since New Media is no longer new, we've changed the title around. Some housekeeping items. So every, every, the journalism school is host to many of these events, and partly because of our location, where we are in the media capital of the world. If you want, for those of you who want to learn more about the journalism school and are interested in any of our programs, we have someone here from admissions, David. David Hooker is here at the back. For those of you who are not here but watching, you can email admissions at jrn.columbia.edu. So let me introduce our guests for tonight, our main guests for tonight. So two years ago, the venerable 150-year-old Atlantic Media Company did what few traditional media organizations have dared to do. They created a project to disrupt themselves. They rethought everything from scratch, their way of reporting, their audience, the creation of uh, the, even their beat structure, the presentation of news, even their business model. The result was Quartz, a digitally native news outlet. If you haven't seen it, it's KZ, KZ, KZ.com. And its focus is the new global economy. Its target readers are mobile, on the road. They have four, maybe five devices in which they read the news. It's a web native site. It introduced, among other things, scrolling news, a scrolling news stream and beats based on what they call obsessions. Today, Quartz says, is it four million? Four million uniques a month? That's what your close press release says. Or oh, is it close to 10 million uniques a month? And it has doubled its revenue between 2013 and 2014, which is in the digital media world a success. 
So let me introduce our Hearst Digital Media Professional in Residence, Kevin Delaney, the Editor-in-Chief and Co-Founder of Quartz. He was a reporter for the Wall Street Journal for a decade be before that, splitting his time between what he calls hardship postings in Paris and San Francisco while covering internet companies such as Google, Twitter, and, my, and Facebook. For the journal, Kevin became interested in these new ways of, of telling the news and reaching out to audiences. He became managing editor of WSJ.com, where he led efforts to expand the journal's online readership and championed innovative journalism projects that went on to win prizes. Ladies and gentlemen, Kevin Delaney. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to our great panel here who rushed uh, from their day jobs to come and be here. Um, there's one, uh, a few things uh, before we get started. Uh, Quartz's URL is not the same as its name, but it is qz.com. And I can't vouch for what's at kz.com, so uh, don't hold me accountable for that. Uh, the second thing is that this question uh, we raised, it probably feels pretty existential to a place like Columbia School of Journalism. Um, we're here to talk about it constructively, to have fun with it, and we're looking for your involvement afterwards. So we're going to go to questions from the crowd here. Um, so we have, uh, I'm going to introduce the panelists. Before I do, I wanted to hear our panelists actually here. Uh, before I did, I wanted to uh, raise sort of three or four quick theses. So. Um, the genesis, in some ways, for the framing of this question is an interview with Capital New York that one of Mitra and my colleagues at Quartz did. Um, you can see the text of it online here. Um, the core of it is this distinction between whether you can teach something and whether you can learn something. Uh, so the question was something about whether you can uh, teach journalism. And uh, Zach answered, I don't know if it can be taught uh, per se, but it definitely can be acquired. Um, and so that's one of the framing for the question, I think, that we're going to look at tonight. Um, the second thing is a variation on this, um, and I don't take credit for this analogy, uh, but the people applied to some other things. Um, but to, to briefly explain why I have chicks up on the screen here, um, one of the, if you're an industrial farmer, one of the challenges is telling the gender of your chicks very quickly, apparently after they hatch. You have to separate them very quickly. It's nearly impossible. Uh, I've read to tell the gender between the chicks. The way that you actually learn to do this is actually by doing it. So they they have all these manuals about how to learn to tell the gender of a chick, but the only surefire way to do it is to have a, a trainee sit beside an expert, they're called sexers, of, of these chicks and learn um, in parallel with the other person. The person pulls up the chick and says, kind of guesses, female. And the, the expert says, wrong, it's male. And they do this dozens and dozens of times, and eventually there's a sixth sense about the gender of chicks, um, which is probably only useful in industrial farming um, that, that develops over time. So well, this may or may not be relevant uh, to the question. I have two more sort of theses or, or observations as we talk about uh, digital journalism. One is, um, 10 years ago, people were writing journalism for robots online. And this is basically Google search robots. And what you do is you would, the famous example was, what time is the Super Bowl? And you'd write a post, the Huffington Post did this, what time is the Super Bowl the, was the headline. The variation was, what time is the, su the, the text was, what time is the Super Bowl? The Super Bowl is at. And if you kind of wrote enough variations on it, you could trick Google search into showing you to millions of Americans who were searching uh, for the time the Super Bowl was. Well, it turns out that the dynamics of the web today are very different, fortunately, and you're writing for people again. And that's because social is the way, is the primary uh, growth in growing platform. And, and victory is when, um, success is when someone actually not only clicks on your headline, but they actually think it's good at the end of the day and they share it. And that probably has some connection to um, the enterprise of teaching journalism for, um, for digital audiences. Um, and then the last thing is, um, is a very simple observation, which is that um, this is effectively what your, what your raw materials are on some ways in digital journalism and what your site looks like or your, your distribution looks like. Something we'll probably come back to in the discussion. Um, 
the last sort of thesis or, or point about this is that, um, is that the journalism, I think, that's most successful online is at the intersection of what is important and what is interesting. It's no longer, uh, it's no longer good, it's really hard to be successful if it's not interesting what you're writing about. And your greatest success is when you combine uh, writing about things that are important and things that are interesting. So we're gonna dive into the discussion now with a few of those with, that we may or may not uh, revisit. And I'm gonna start by introducing our panel. I have Stacy, who's very far away, Stacy Marie Ishmael. She's the Vice President of Communities at the Financial Times for a few more weeks. Uh, and she's going to BuzzFeed in, as of December to be the editor of BuzzFeed News app. Yeah, we um, have to work on that title. <laughs> so the, uh, she's the editor of the BuzzFeed News app, which you may or may not have read about. Um, they started talking about a uh, uh, native app uh, to deliver news updates. Um, Stacy has worked at the Financial Times in several sort of stints. Earlier, she was uh, the founder, co-founder of Tilt and Alphaville. They're very popular, uh, or Alphaville at least, they're very popular <laughs> financial blogs. <laughs> Um, Tilt got shut down. Tilt got <laughs> shut down. And then uh, she was a product manager at Percolate, which is a social uh, startup. Next to her is Joel Johnson, who started his career or spent parts of his career at Wired in Popular Mechanics. He's a 10-year veteran of Gawker and today is the editorial director at Gawker Media and has played a role in starting a lot of Gawker's uh, most popular sites, including Kotaku, Kotaku and we don't what else? Know how to say. You don't know how to say it either? Okay, good. Um, and then finally, we have Mitra Kalita, who is my colleague at Quartz. She's the ideas editor there. Mitra was also a colleague at the Wall Street Journal. Before that, she's a co-founder of Mint, the business newspaper in India. She's worked at the Washington Post. She's working on her fourth book now, and it has taught here at Columbia. So we're gonna dive in. I'm gonna shift over. Stacey, I'm gonna go to you first and ask you, um, to define this question that we're, we're talking about and the digital journalism part of it. What, do, what does that mean to you? I haven't written any books, so take what you will from this. One of the issues, or shall we say, one of the challenges I have with the framing of things as digital journalism is I'm gonna go back to what your um, academic dean said, which is that you know I've been on the internet long enough that I've seen web 2.0, web 3.0, new media, now it's digital media, and it's like content has taken over everything else. And I'm not 100% convinced that everything that we say is specific to digital journalism really is specific to digital journalism, as opposed to just reporting and journalism more broadly. I do think there are certain ways of thinking about media and audiences that have changed. And I was struck by Zach's quote where he was talking about it. I don't think it's possible to teach this per se. I don't know if anybody has ever had to try to teach Zach anything <laughs> about the internet. And in the context of the discussion that we're having, I think one of the challenges here is there are people in this room who buy into the notion of being or perceiving yourself as a digital native, you know, which I don't actually think is something that exists. I don't think that because you were born at a time when a technology was popular means you are naturally proficient in or an expert at that particular technology. I think you're more familiar with it and you're more at ease with it, which makes you more likely to be able to become proficient. But I don't think you are by default a specialist. And so in terms of can you teach something, I do really believe that journalism schools can provide an extremely useful environment in which these kinds of skills and practices can be disseminated, and crucially, that they can be practiced. Because going back to your chick sex example, because weirdly I read that study, yeah. um, the, the, thing, the key thing was that you watched and you learned from the expert. And one of the things that Columbia is already doing in the context of a lot of your digital training is you're watching and you're learning from experts. You have experts and residents. You have people coming in and showing you their work that is not similar to you know, traditional pedagogy where there's somebody talking at you about like, this is a good lead, or this is how you write a good lead. It's like, go out and produce a story and get people to read that. And that's practice in a way that I think is very interesting and very useful. And so just to be clear, so you're saying there, you're not sure there's a distinction between digital journalism and journalism more broadly? I think there are certain fundamental skills 
that are nece necessary for the practice of journalism. I think there are some that are emerging, that are made possible by digital. Yeah. So, you know, like reporting at scale, data gathering at scale, analysis at scale, audience development at scale. It's basically scale <laughs> yeah. is the thing that separates it and some of the ways of gathering that information. But I'm not sure that the thing it takes to be able to pick up a phone or a Skype or a FaceTime and ask good questions that lead to revealing information are fundamentally distinct in an analog world versus a digital one. So what's, do you want to jump in? I, I mean, I would, I would throw out the notion or the idea. Uh, the only difference between journalism and digital journalism is like, that's a business question, right? Like, are you, a, are you still like a legacy print organization? Thank you or, to everybody reading the print FT. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, print's fine. I'm not anti-print, but I'm, I'm saying, like, I don't know any single journalist working that uses a different set of tools if they're writing for online or, or digital. Like, it's just a distribution question. Uh, and by the same token, I don't think that the, 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 the tools are maybe new, but it's always been journalists for, you know, at least modern American journalism has always embraced technology and used whatever it can. So just because it's the internet now or computers now doesn't really change the equation. It just means that we're modern. Um, I, I think the only thing that maybe has changed is the way that you can speak to your audience is definitely different. And the idea that uh, individual writers should engage their audience and their sources over social and all of the other ways. Like that's obviously different. That's a lot less hierarchical. hierarchical I can't ever say that word yeah. uh, than traditional. But besides that, I mean, especially for people that are in J school now, like you know, most there's going to be all sorts of businesses. If you're a freshman now, like half the print businesses will still be not out of business, but they'll 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 be all digitally focused by the time you graduate. So one, so what, you, what you're both saying, I think, is that the uh, approach to reporting, to writing itself, to engaging with your, uh, maybe not engaging with your readership, because in, as a, at a print newspaper, you don't know who your readership is necessarily. Um, but that's very similar. My question, I have a question, a follow-up question, maybe, Joel, for you, which is about the origin, the framing, the idea for a story, the sort of, the, um, sense of what people will want to read. Um, that, that feels like a new s important skill in digital journalism that is different from the way it is. Are you getting at the tyranny of the Dentonist analytics? The, the, tyr <laughs> the tyranny of, the, uh, of Nick Denton's analytics. Joel, what's your uh, On which BuzzFeed was built. So. <laughs> hey. It's, but yeah, it, it works. Um, I, the, the main difference, I think, is that Positioning a story is now left to almost entirely the headline uh, and how that disseminates across social platforms. Like, that's all you got left. And so you have a very direct way. I mean, there was a lot of people like uh, Upworthy and the, like, like uh, Upworthy is an entire uh, business built on like A-B testing for yeah, uh, headlines. Facebook. Yeah, and, and for Facebook, um, which is fine. That's one way to do it. Uh, I would not to like, you know, clarify too much or whatever, but I, I, I think what we do at Gawker Media 95% of the time isn't journalism, it's packaging. Like that's our, that's our like that's what we do. We're really good at, we're, we're op-ed plus packaging and then occasionally real journalism. Um, and I don't say that to denigrate ourselves, but it's to say that's like, that's what we are better at than most of our competitors or at least were for the last decade and now a lot of people are, are catching up. Yeah. Um, I forgot the original question. <laughs> like, Fine. Mitra, do you want to do you want to jump in? Um, so, I do think that the core of it, though, is curiosity, right? So, as you're thinking about what do people want to read, it's what is the question that they want to answer. Um, mm -hmm. And so, as we talk about this definition of digital versus non, you have to look at why, for example, is New York Magazine able to take a New York Times story and get more readers on it? simply by reframing it or putting on a headline. Um, and I think it's because they are thinking about the reader um, at the outset of that process. Um, and I think it's something that often gets lost as you or we are learning our skills that you actually don't think about the distribution of that news. Um, you're thinking about how to collect the news and your end game is just as important, possibly more important. 
Um, and then the other thing I just add about audience that I think distinguishes digital a little bit, um, and the J School used to be notorious for this, was you know you would go to a community board meeting and say, uh, and your professor would say, you're not writing for the people in the room. Right? You would go to a meeting and come back and what would you tell your mother, what would you tell your friend, and that's kind of where you begin the story. And I feel like at Quartz and probably all of our outlets to a large extent, we are thinking of the people in the room, right? Those are captive readers. Those are guaranteed readers, actually. If you're covering a meeting, the people in the room are probably going to read your story about it. How do you serve them better? Um, and what is the propensity of a story to start with a niche audience, as Joel was talking about, and move outwards? Can I jump in? Yeah, ahead, yeah. I think what's really interesting is you've both alluded to this idea of having to care about distribution and understand it. So, you know, you talked about digital journalism being a business concept. And one of the things that my, you know, older school print colleagues took for granted is that they never had to think about distribution. They never, I mean, to the extent of starting with the headline, you know, there, I remember being in the FT at a time when we were like, journalists are gonna write headlines themselves. And I was like, whoa, whoa, <laughs> I'm sorry, what? <laughs> write my own headline? Craziness. And the, the fact is that is, I think, possibly the most significant shift in the collapse of the distinction between the story and the distribution of the story and what and how digital has like enabled that. And partly, it's not only technology, it's also the business model, it's that you know, when you were, when you had a print model, your audience, the people who paid for the news were the advertisers. And increasingly in digital, the people who are paying for the news are the people reading it, you know, whether it's a subscription or the people who are the inventory for the advertisers, but there's a much more direct relationship with the audience. And you as a journalist are now more directly responsible for getting in front of that audience in a way. And I think that is actually a skill that is underrated and really, really useful. And one of the things that more and more journalism schools should be thinking about, how do we help people understand what those responsibilities look like and what the rules of engagement are? Because there is a line now in, you know, about the community meeting. It used to be that you would declare, like, I'm a reporter, I'm in the community meeting. Now you just kind of look and read people's Twitter exchanges, and then they end up in your stories. And they didn't necessarily know that you were there. And I think that is also something that needs to be addressed and taught and talked about a little bit more. How do you, I mean, one of the things that's emerging is you're talking about in interaction with the reader that really honestly, having been a print reporter for, for a solid decade or longer, I can tell you did not exist uh, between the, read, uh, the, the journalist and the reader. And I think there, you've, you've talked about kind of the end point a little bit. I'm interested before we move on, the, the starting point, which I think Mitra was alluding to, which was uh, kind of looking at social for um, ideas for things that are happening in the world, um, but also developing a sense of what people might want to read and using that as a filter, Facebook or Twitter or Reddit or whatever, whatever other thing there is. Joel, do you? Yeah, there's a real point of tension, and I, and I don't know that I have piece with it necessarily, but obviously uh, you see it on any publication or community or anywhere online that there's a feedback loop if you, if you mm -hmm. listen to people uh, socially voting things up or voting things down or yeah. whatever, you're only going to report on, on the things that they say they want, not necessarily things they need. Uh, that's like the eternal journalism question is nobody actually Cake wants to read vegetables. Yeah, the <laughs> things that they really should read or should care about. Um, I, I would say we, we have a couple of instincts that I think are fairly universal that we look for within the people that come into our organization, which is a, a very quick ability to see not only is something actually important, but is it worth responding to mm -hmm. and is it horse shit right out of the <laughs> gate? Like you have, to be able to, you have to be able to read that I think far quicker than you had to before the internet existed because the news cycles are so much faster that you need to be able to have your take on it faster. Um, but I also think that you're going to lose, any publication loses their voice if they respond entirely to the whims of the crowd. Like people yeah. come to us sometimes for, whether they know it or not, for the stories that we are ignoring uh, and not just the stories that we're putting in front of them. And I like to think of it as, uh, 
it's like cooking, you know? It's like you, you have to have the balance of, and I mean, this is why BuzzFeed has done very well and, and why, if BuzzFeed has any failing, it's that they haven't marketed their really excellent news work in the really journal, good journalists totally there. Yeah, so that. get on it, yeah. <laughs> but it's like, you know, that's what, that's what is happening now in the news business online is that you give people not just, you know, the joke is cat videos, but it's not, it's not actually just cat videos. It's, it's a slice of the zeitgeist, it's a slice of pop culture, and then you figure out how to weave the things that they should be paying attention to in there. Mm -hmm. So it's the things, it, you're taking your signals from social, but you're not, you can't only do that and follow the... I mean, you can notes. do that, but then you're a social... Just site. less good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what do you, so I wanna ask a, a few questions more directly related to journalism and education. One of them is what are the skills uh, that you look for in people that you're hiring? Mitra, you mentioned curiosity, I think was probably one of them, if you wanna add to that. And then the second thing is, is, is to come back to this question uh, of can, can, uh, can digital journalism be taught and, and add to it? How, do you, how concretely do you, uh, do you teach it? Or would you teach it? Do you want to, maybe we'll start on the, the skills and then we'll come around again on this. So, uh, segueing from what readers want to know and, and sort of stoking that, um, I, I do hope that journalists also come to this with a desire to, and this is very basic, but a desire to truly inform and that there are stories of the moment that people need to know about um, and to marry some of the other skills we're talking about, how to make it interesting, how to package it, how to frame it, how do you write the headline on it, um, to make those, or perhaps fool readers, into wanting to know about them. Um, and so some of the stories um, of the global economy are not about cat videos or of the most sexy, um, trending thing on Facebook, but it's incumbent upon us to make them interesting um, and accessible to readers. And, I, and it sounds basic, but it's actually a very, very hard um, process. So the ability to tell a story from the inside out um, is really important. And I feel like I spent a lot of my career doing um, immigration reporting, and then I was overseas for a while, so I was always trying to get inside the story and then figure out a way to almost translate it to the world. And so because I was obsessed with community, I had, it, actually digital was a really good um, segue for me. For folks who are coming from more traditional beats, um, I actually don't know that it's been entirely natural. Um, and then the other, the final thing I'll just say is um, just to be real. Like the worst thing you can see on Twitter is when a journalist is trying <laughs> to brand themselves oh, or brand promote journalism. themselves <laughs> or, um, uh, sound, it's so obvious, how and it's like... How do you know? What are the... Uh, too many signs? hashtags. <laughs> too many hashtags. Yeah, or it's, it just feels very forced. Um, I mean, the thing is, as I say it, I've done it, right? <laughs> I look at some of my tweets from last year, and I'm like, oh, God, you were so insecure then, right? So, you know, the good news is, and maybe <laughs> we're sitting here on the day, is like, you'll get to a point of comfort, so just start with the point of comfort, pl the place of comfort, I should say. Um, and I think brands are doing this too. Like, you see a lot of startups that get big, um, media startups included, and their tweets start out really conversational and so organic, and then they probably hired a social media editor who was taught to do things a certain way, and then it feels very formal, and no longer the authenticity that I think readers are actually craving from the internet. Jill, what do you what do you look for when you're hiring journalists? Uh, well, so first of all, uh, most of the time I can't figure out if somebody's going to actually hack it or not unless they actually do it. And a big difference between our organization and most organizations is that we have absolutely no problem giving people our entire platform and saying like, all right, there's. Yeah. you know, 100 million people, like, go make an ass of yourself and we'll see how you do, because we have, I, I, I don't know, but probably one of the least amount of editorial oversight on each of our writers of any media organization our size, and we think that's, like, part of what makes us us and why that's... How many strong. journalists do you have, roughly? Uh, I've got 150 full-time staffers. Okay. Um, and most of them post directly to the page without any editorial oversight. Like, editing for us is something that we call in when it's needed, right? It's like, hey, I got this really big piece, I need another set of eyes on it, and we have, we have structure for that. But in general, we let people post. 
And so by the same token, uh, the only way I can really know if somebody's going to work out is to put them out there and they sink or swim. And I've even built my staffing and like the recruits program and a lot of that stuff around that. Um, what are the qualities? But, of the yeah, but what I'm succeed? looking for, like, what I'm looking for is the ability to turn out good copy very quickly with no uh, second guessing, essentially. Uh, like, there is a time for second guessing, but not at the speed that people need to write. Like, uh, my people generally can write as fast as they think or and can usually put out first draft copy that is as good as it's going to get that may be because we're all terrible but like <laughs> that's what we do that's what that's that's our skill set and yeah. i actually find uh hiring for gawker media is incredibly difficult not because um and and part of the reason we tend to hire young it's not because uh, older people don't get the internet. It's not like that digital native, you know, kind of thing. It's just that younger people are less, uh, I, I don't want to say lazy, but like they're not in there. They're not in that like headspace. Like you have some yeah. writers that once they've taught themselves, well, I got to labor over every word and do this, then they're stuck there forever. So and we need people that can turn it around. We need people that are willing to, uh, what we do, what, what we do, which is, again, not always journalism, uh, but the kind of writing that we do uh, is somewhere between traditional uh, media writing and uh, like performance or stand-up or something like that. You have to do it as, you, as it's happening. Journalism as performance. Yeah. yeah. Um, some, uh, the folks at Business Insider compare it to television, to live television mm -hmm. in some ways, because you're just kind of out there talking. Um, Stacey, what do you look for in, or what do you see or look for in successful I've had to think journalists? about this a lot because I have hired lots of people and I will be hiring lots of people, just so you know. Um, I have a couple of personality traits and then some core skills. So in terms of personality, one of my biggest rules in hiring, especially for digital actually, is I have a, an absolute intolerance of assholes. Like I cannot have people on my team. Uh, we're always hiring assholes. <laughs> <laughs> Go to go her. Um, <laughs> I cannot have people on my team who don't understand how to work collaboratively because going back to what we talked about with like the flattening of newsrooms, when you are on a digital team, someday you're an editor, sometimes you're a photographer, sometimes you're shooting video and if like you're the one that nobody wants to work with, it means there's going to be a whole day a week when nothing gets done because nobody wants to talk to you. So assholes are completely out. C relentless curiosity. Like I can't handle when I ask somebody like what's interesting, like stuff. <laughs> like, you know, one of, one of my, I have always had jobs where my responsibility was to like know what was going on in the internet at all times, and when somebody is able to tell me something that I haven't read, I'm like genuinely impressed that this person is, you know, has found something I haven't seen, or is using an app I haven't tried, or is deeply and obsessively interested in something that I have never heard of, but they're, you know, able to explain to me and to translate in a really clear and accessible way. I think that's incredibly important. In a previous life, I was, a, I was very into people who were strong copywriters, who could make sentences sing, who could make things sing, but that's because I came from a world in which print it was like print uber alice, and now I have to think about, do you understand visuals? Can you tell a story using a chart or a picture or a slideshow? Like, do you think beyond text? Um, and I think you know, writing has expanded to include a lot of these things. And then in terms of e essential skills, I've recently been asking people to show me evidence that they have built things. And it could be a newsletter, it could be a portfolio page, it could be one single feature on your, in your site or in your newsroom or in your organization. I need to, you to show me that you had an idea that, and you figured out that this idea was important enough either to you or your team or to the organization and you figured out how to get that thing built and that you figured out how to make that happen. And in the context of a newsroom it could be I pushed for us to do an investigative series on X. In the context of a product, it could be I, I, I decided that we should have a call to action for this email over here. Or, you know, I mean, it's so, it's trivially easy now to start something. And when I get applications from people who have no evidence that they've ever done anything outside of the things they had to do, I am just bored, completely bored. Mm -hmm. we're, gonna, we're gonna take questions in a few minutes and I'm gonna ask you to stand up there. Um, I wanna ask the other question now, and Mitra, we can start with you again. Um, this question, how do you teach digital journalism? Oh. Um, I made a mistake a few years ago when I was teaching here and I had um, the class do the aggregation exercise at the end of the semester. <laughs> 
And the following year, I did it at the beginning um, because I found that, and maybe I, I do not think it was a function of teaching them so well, but the, uh, the first semester I found that the accessibility in writing uh, became like instant, whereas the, and, and so I said, if we started from a place of accessibility, uh, wouldn't journalism be so much better, right? If it was from this place where our goal is just for people to understand what is happening, um, that's really empowering. So um, I think that uh, should be taught. I, I can't teach empathy, um, but I really value it. And I, I try to put, um, I, I do this as a teacher, but I, I, I hope more professors do this, is to put people in situations that um, expose you to the need for empathy. I mm -hmm. think it's a really important part of what, again, I talked about authenticity in digital, but um, we do have this ability um, and responsibility to bring people into different worlds. And, and so, um, so the more exposure I can offer on that front, the better. Um, I, you know, I regret not doing more with data when I was studying journalism, and because I worked at the Wall Street Journal, I just had so much more exposure to it and trial by fire kind of thing. Um, but I think that's another area that if you can gain comfort with will um, serve you well digitally. Oh, and then the last thing is that I come out of New York City tabloid culture, which uh, is amazing training for digital because uh, I worked at Newsday, but you would line up all the papers and basically say, well, what's my plan of attack on the six stories I just got beat on? And so it just, the, the, the quickness of it all um, was so invaluable and I didn't even know the world that was coming when I was going through that. Joel, do you, do you try and teach? digital journalism or is it just the audition and sink uh, or swim? No, we, we definitely have a role for, uh, we, we brought in, we brought in uh, their fellows or now we tend to just do like an entry level position. Uh, but uh, the way, the first thing we always have people do is go scout headlines, which is aggregation. Go, go, find, go find the stories that matter. Go find us pieces that we should be attacking. Uh, because if they can't do that, that's it. Like you, you have no story sense, and if you don't have any story sense, what's what are you doing? You know, like then you should just be writing copy for somebody who has story sense. Um, and so people people who don't have a story sense are not viable for you. Not for us. I mean, yeah. you know, it's I, I don't want to be like they may have roles in other organizations, yeah. but we're at heart an aggregation organization, and probably always uh, will be. I think that uh, it's kind of like what you were saying really struck true or if you're not passionate about every way to get information into your head if you're not one of those people that just wants to know what's happening all the time everywhere <laughs> then you're pretty screwed like there there's there's no there's no teaching you that and it may, you know, it may only be about a subject area. It doesn't have to be about the whole world. That's been one of the reasons that I'm in management as opposed to being, like I kind of came up through the technology journalist uh, path. But part of the reason I'm in, in management is I do, I do like to know a little bit about everything, although I'm not, you know, it's, I'm not an expert about most things. But if you don't have that instinct, then J School is not gonna give you that instinct. So I think there's lots of things that, um, and again, I, I have to come back to the, there's no distinction between digital journalism and journalism. They're just practically at this stage, there just isn't. And so uh, the things that you can be taught are, there's lots of things that you can absorb. And some of my best people that have ever worked for me have come out of J schools, Columbia, Mizzou, U of O. Uh, there's some really good schools out there, but do be aware that at this point, uh, Everything is changing so fast, year by year by year. Like what our business was today versus what it was four years ago is wildly different, and how we make money is different, and how what headlines work today are different. All of that. So just be as much as you can prepare yourself to be in the the mix and to be fast and to be adaptive to change because that's the only thing that we can accurately predict. Stacy. Yeah, I have actually taught this, so I should be able to answer this question. So I, I've, t I've taught digital journalism in kind of in different contexts when I was an adjunct at another journalism organization. I taught classes on covering Wall Street and writing about companies. And one of the core parts of my syllabus was that you would have to do a ton of research on, you know, 
understanding how you use digital tools to get access to company information and things like that. And so in addition to teaching people about balance sheets and money and finance, it was also how do you search the website of the Securities and Exchange Commission to be able to find what Google did today, et cetera. And like you, I, I put that later in the curriculum than I would have if I were doing that today because I feel like knowing how and where sources of information live and are sometimes actively hidden from you is something that's really, really important. And I don't think there is sufficient focus on equipping reporters, especially if you have a beat reporting structure, with an, an understanding of the different kinds of places that information that is critically relevant to their beats lives. Like it used to be that if you were a reporter, they were like the wires, right? And you would be a copy taste and you would sort of look at things that were coming in and you would have specific sources and you would call them. But now, you know, if you're covering something like Ebola, if you're you know, a, health and, a health and science reporter, for example, you need to know that the CDC is not gonna call you and tell you that they're changing their guide guidelines. They're gonna post that on their website or there might be an internal list there and you have to know how to get on these things. And even with business and finance now, there are kind of an, you know, there's an increasing sophistication in the ways that companies hide their information from you. And you need to know how to get those and those are increasingly digital things. So that's absolutely something that I would focus on. I would also spend some time on verification and sourcing. So I did a, a presentation, you can find it somewhere online called Don't Trust and Verify. And it was about, it was essentially a slideshow of journalists getting caught out by idiotic rumors on Twitter and perpetuating them because they didn't take two seconds to check if that photo was real or how old that link was or if that picture that was supposedly of the soldier in the storm was actually from a year ago and it's a completely different thing. And verification and sourcing is a core journalism skill, right? It's something that you should do as a reporter, but there is something about being in a different context that makes people switch parts of their brain off. You know, in, in the newsroom 30 years ago when the fax machine was introduced, people would get caught out by spoof faxes. And now people are getting caught out by like spoof press releases and spoof emails and spoof websites and like fairly complex hoaxes. But there are ways to get to the root of these things. And I think because we don't think about it as distinct, we don't necessarily focus on it. Another one, you know, going back to Mitch's point, is about data and analytics. You know, not because you have to be ruled by them, but because you have to understand them. You have to understand what numbers mean. You have to understand how that affects sometimes the, your, the outcomes of your story. Like if you are interested in public interest journalism and you don't know how many people are reading your story, you are not doing your job. And there are ways to understand those things and contextualize them. And like, what is the difference between somebody seeing your story and somebody reading your story and somebody sharing your story and why should you care? And then I would absolutely teach people about the business of media. Because if you are a digital journalist and you don't know what the funding model is for the company that you work for, you're also fundamentally terrible at your job. Because this is an incredibly transformational time in media. And if you want to work for somebody like a Vox or a 538 or a BuzzFeed or the FT or the Wall Street Journal and you don't get what the drivers are that are affecting the business decisions they're making that are changing your newsroom, like, why are you even here? Great. You basically need to learn, you need to know everything that <laughs> used to be compartmentalized yeah. in every different department. You, you are need now, to learn the full stack. Absolutely. Yeah, full stack journalism. Tweet that. Um, but, but I think it, the biggest thing is teaching people to think of themselves as editors much earlier on. Because you have lost the ability to go into a, a newsroom and have people look at your story before you make a complete idiot of yourself. You've lost the people who would ask, have you checked this? How do you know? Are you sure? Where did you get this from? Did you ask them for permission? You know, like basic questions. And so reporters have to edit themselves much more. And ed editing and reporting are distinct skill sets, but I, they're collapsing. I do want to throw one corollary to what you said, though, which is something I experienced a lot, because I'm basically self-taught. I just learned by posting a bunch of blog posts. Um, there's more access to information. It's easier to get information now than it almost ever was before. And so many people come through, and I'm guilty of it myself. There's, it used to be uh, the idea of like journalist as gumshoe, and it was like, well, of course, I'm gonna you know, sleuth this down, and I've got weeks to track down this one lead in this one story. And now what happens is you're like, you Google it, and you're like, well, this is who I call for this, and you pick up the phone, maybe, if you, a lot of people don't even pick up the phone, and it's like, okay, I gotta try to talk to this person, oh, they're not there, gone, by. And, like, that's, you have now thousands of ways to get the information that you need, and to verify the information you need. There's so many ways to lock it down, but it's almost paralyzing. And the more that you can become 
comfortable with the amount of information that, and the amount of tools that are at your fingertips, like, it's a lot easier to stand out. Yeah. And it, it, it's actually, <laughs> it's remedial, uh, or, the, or some, of the, some of the posts that we put up are like, that do really good traffic are literally just going, like, this email uh, is not true. <laughs> like, like, we called the guy in the email and it said it's not true, and everybody's like, oh my God, a million hits. Like, it's really not true. And like, you know, we, there's, there's so much value in shutting down bad narratives. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of ways, that's what journalism is at heart, is like fixing the narrative or fixing bad information. And uh, so don't, I've, I've found myself at times on stories being like, I don't know where to go next. And that was almost always because I didn't have a set of like mentors and a set of people that I could refer to. And a lot of times, you know, and it took a few years in my career until I had that. And then those were the people that were literally like, pick up the phone, make like, call. call them. So we're going to, on that, we're going to go to questions. There is a microphone over there. Can I ask anyone who has a question to stand up and ask your question in the microphone? Thank you. Hi, I'm Tammy Louie. I'm a senior writer at CNN Money and used to work with Mitra at Newsday. And I'm also an adjunct professor here. And two things that I'm also seeing a lot at CNN Money, you mentioned headline writing, which I think is a big difference between print and digital today. So, and the other thing that I see that's different about digital writing is voice. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering what you thought about possibly focusing a little more than we do here on headline writing or on framing the story by thinking of the headline first. That's kind of what we do now at CNN Money. What's the headline? And what do you think, you know, I think there's, I think there's a lot of benefit to, but I think we also still focus on the traditional, you know, neutral type of writing. Should we be focusing a little bit more here on adding a little voice, not necessarily opinion, but voice? So just on the headlines, I'll just take that quickly. And, and our, the way we talk to train our journalists at Quartz is that they should write the headline first. And the headline should be the tweet. And the headline should be the most interesting thing about a story. And if you don't know what the most interesting thing about a story is, you probably should think about it before you, before you actually get into it. That might mean doing more reporting. That might mean writing a little bit to, to sort of work it out. But that, that's definitely our experience. Do you guys want to, well, there's a question of voice, I think, which is the other. Well, just two things on headline and voice. I actually forgot to disagree with you about something you said earlier, which is that we don't write for robots anymore. We, we write for more robots than ever. We write yeah. for the Facebook robots. We write for the yeah. Twitter robots. We write for the, Groups if you. Groups of people that are indistinguishable from robots. Indeed. Yeah. Um, but also, if you're a finance writer, you're writing for, like, algorithmic trading. And that's what you need to ask yourself when you, when you don't start with framing it as, like, what, what's the headline, what's the voice? It's like, who is this for? Right, because your audience is going to change depending. You know, we have different audiences, um, and even sometimes within our audiences, we have different audiences. So we will sometimes post a story on the main FT Facebook page and post that same story on the the page for MBA students, and we have to change the way that we present that headline and sometimes that voice because they're expecting different things. And I think in terms of voice, you know, like the traditional view from nowhere. People do expect different things, but they also expect it to be idiomatic to the platform that they're on. Like the Facebook voice is different from the Tumblr voice, it's different from the Twitter voice, it's different from the email voice. And so it's not so much about replacing an institutional voice with another institutional voice. I think it's about being sent much more sensitive and much more aware of who is going to be on the other end of that story. You can also put voice in your headlines, and I um, have, I, I sort of look for um, keywords. So, um, for example, we write a lot about, um, well, in the idea section, we've been doing a lot with parenting and like sort of a high level of parenting. And the word children versus kids, for example, children to me feels kind of clinical, kind of distant, right? Kids, on the other hand, is like when people ask me, I talk about my kids, right? It's just much more conversational. So there's like a little bit of voice in the headline. Um, if we, there's one headline I'm thinking of which was about math education, and the headline on it was the key difference between kids who are good at math and those who aren't, or something like that. And the reason I think that piece actually took off, yes, it was about global competitiveness and how the U.S. is screwed and the <laughs> stories that you've probably read, but the word kids not only made it accessible, but also for readers made it kind of actionable, right? How can I prevent my kids from sucking at math? 
Um, and so I feel like that headline kind of found a few different communities. Insecure parents. Insecure oh, yeah. parents they, was one. Mm -hmm. um, economists was another. Mm -hmm. Educators mm -hmm. was another. <laughs> um, and so I think you're kind of trying to send flags in the headline to write. See, I, I really do try to keep writing for people and thinking of um, how they'll relate to this. The other thing is like a store versus a pizza franchise or a pizza store. So, I mean, pizza is so much more concrete and in the global economy is like this universal thing. Um, Starbucks, coffee, these are things that we consume versus, um, again, like retail is something that I've written about ad nauseum as a business reporter and I've don't, I can't remember the last time I used retail in a headline. Okay, great. Thank you. Take another question. We have a two-way line forming. <laughs> My name is Katie Jennings and I'm a postgrad fellow here at the J School and um, recently we've seen Bloomberg has made a lot of digital media hires. They got Joe Eisenthal, got Justin, Smith. Fighter, <laughs> Justin Smith, yeah. um, what are they, what do you think they're doing? <laughs> and, uh, I'm going to let Stacy answer this. <laughs> yeah. And also, you know, they're traditional, they have TV, wire service. Can a media organization transition into the digital space? Do you think it's going to be successful? I mean, I'm obliged to say the FC is kicking ass at transitioning <laughs> into the um, digital space. But on, on the, yes, I do think that digital organizations, that organizations can transition, but it, they first have to stop dividing their newsroom into like the print people and the digital people, and they have to stop underpaying their, their digital journalists. Like that is just appalling. Um, the, the differences in the salaries between the print people and digital people in newsrooms that are calling themselves digital is like, there should be stories about this. But in terms of what Bloomberg is up to, um, Bloomberg has a lot of money, right, as an organization. They make ridiculous amounts of money, like the kinds of cash that CEOs at other media organizations like weep about at night. And it gives them a huge amount of runway to experiment. And this isn't the first time that they have tried to figure out the internet, right? They are, I think this is their third foray in the past five years into like ramping up a major digital media organization. What I think is interesting about what they're doing is who they're hiring. Um, Justin is incredibly good at, acquire, at you know, talent spotting and talent cultivation. And he has built up a team around him of people who come from magazine backgrounds who've moved into, who've moved into digital. He hired Joe Wiesenthal, who you know, was like the TV of the internet. He's got just a quite a strong and interesting group, none of whom, if you put them in a room, would agree about anything at all. And I think that, you know, that, that's a strength and it makes it interesting to watch because I think what Bloomberg is trying to do is figure out how do you, do be, how do you continue to be Bloomberg 100 years from now? And that requires a lot of experimenting. But I, I haven't actually, I couldn't tell you what their actual strategy is. The, the big question also is how much leanness forces innovation. So we come out of building products where Kevin, I love Kevin, but did not throw 50 people my way to launch the ideas section of Quartz, which means that when readers write to us at the email at the bottom of our stories, it actually comes to me, right? There's no clerk answering our emails. And so what that creates is a rapport. Uh, a lot of the pieces that have gone viral from us are from that inbox. Um, and so they can try to recreate some of that innovation culture, mm -hmm. but a lot of it, at, at least at Quartz I can speak for, but also the other uh, startups I've launched comes from not having somebody else to do it. Um, and that's, I think, the big question of can you reverse engineer innovation into a legacy newsroom? And even like new newsrooms. Okay, so Vox is not an innovative newsroom beyond like, cards and explaining things to people. Right? They have very traditional structures. They have a managing editor, like really a managing editor, um, which is actually an incredibly useful thing to have in a newsroom run by young people. But that, you know, you couldn't necessarily look at the Vox newsroom and say, oh, it's completely different from the FT newsroom or the Wall Street Journal newsroom. And so there's this idea of like, what, you know, what does innovation in media look like? And I think the people who are doing this are the ones who you wouldn't have considered, like, you know, like Gorka Media and what BuzzFeed is trying to do and coming from a technology platform. And even things sort of like Fusion, which is a TV station, is not a TV station, is building a team in New York that's about to do interesting things. Like, we don't know. And a lot of this is happening outside of the US. Like, if you haven't looked at what Blendle is trying to do in the Netherlands, even if you completely disagree with their model, you should. Because, you know, I'm, Bloomberg is probably going to be able to buy all of us one day. But in the meantime, those of us without that kinds of money are trying to figure that out as well. <laughs> Great. Thank you. 
Lucia Hoffman, and I am an MS student here. Well, I, I love Twitter, and I cover professional tennis, and you know, I use hashtags and things because you know I think it's a new world out there, and you know, nobody's a David Carr. You know, he has almost 500,000 or your um, you know publication that's very popular too. So. Um, do, do you think we should judge a journalist just because he, if he's doing his job well and, you know, he has a public out there and actually sometimes, you know, if he's putting the story there and, you know, he's putting the name of the company there, it's good marketing for everybody, right? It's a new road. So why, why would you judge a journalist? Uh, so I should probably that? should clarify. It's the tonal issue. So yeah. if it's... Um, we I, should go through my Twitter feed. <laughs> I should go through my Twitter feed to give you a sense of what I mean. It's uh, kind of trying to sound perhaps official or above it all or I mean it's just I'm just saying to be real on Twitter because your audience is going to be able to know. Um, Don't be thirsty. Yeah, man. No, I know. <laughs> that's, that's I know, but, but numbers on Twitter don't lie either. So if you go and see if that person is getting more uh, followers. I mean, I th you should not be obsessed with media Twitter because it is just like a yeah. weird and incestuous yeah, not, and messed up place. place. It is not representative of humanity for the good of humanity. <laughs> um, and there's like a lot of weird hate following and weirdness. And, and real Twitter is called Facebook? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know what real Twitter is. So, like, no, 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 but just one question them about that. So, but don't, don't you see more like Twitter, like you guys, uh, not just you because you're talking about digital media, but you turn on TV and everybody has a Twitter. Yeah, account. and that's because so Twitter has a very, be very good PR team, right? I think the, what you need to figure out, you write about tennis, like, so the, the, the sports audience, there's a heavy Facebook audience for sports, there's a heavy Pinterest audience for sports, because sports photography does extremely well on Pinterest, and I think there is a narrative within journalism schools and definitely within newsrooms that because we spend a lot of time on Twitter, we think everybody else should, and we think that's necessarily where all of our audiences are going to be, but one of the things, and kind of going back to what I would teach people, I would teach people how to figure out where the, where the natural people are, like who are the people in the room for that particular story. And sometimes it is Twitter, and Twitter's benefiting from a lot of good branding, but I see the analytics and I see the traffic that the different social sites drive back to different stories. And like Twitter is up there, but it's not number one. And it's, no, it's like number two by an order of magnitude lower because there are just more people on other platforms who are interested in the things that we're reading. Like email is a huge channel for us because we write for busy investment bankers and central bankers and people who still like Blackberries who are not Kim Kardashian. Um, I don't think she's an FT reader necessarily. So we had to figure that out. And if we, you know, if we only optimize for a Twitter strategy, we would be missing a huge chunk of our audience. So you know, we're not saying that if you have found an audience on a social platform, you shouldn't figure out how to connect with them and you should absolutely put yourself out there, but you shouldn't confine yourself to whatever like people like us on panels are saying is like the new hotness because it's usually wrong. You know, personally, I just like Twitter, but it's about all the platforms because I think they're important, right? That's what we are talking about. Right? When you talk about digital media, isn't that what you're talking also? How, you know, just to send it, you know, to all the audience. So, no, I was just curious because, um, you know, how can a journalist like help your publication or, you know, either Facebook, Twitter, or, you know, whatever. I just think they're very... Well, I think you're hitting on something very interesting, uh, which is that, like, as much as I recoil at the notion of, like, journalists or anybody having to work on their personal brand, what I think is important about that notion is that your name and your work has to transcend all digital, all social, everything. It, it has to just be, like, on in the media on the internet okay. because what we're seeing more increasingly and part of the reason that companies like buzzfeed uh gawkers <laughs> trying to be this uh maybe not as well as buzzfeed uh but the reason that tech and and uh tech and media companies are merging is because in the future owning the distribution platform is going to be just as important, really important as anything yeah. else and so, you know, Carr's piece on Monday I thought was really interesting about Facebook. I mean, we've seen this coming forever, like it's no big surprise, but they're swinging 1.37 billion people a day. Uh, you know, they, the, the, the biggest existential fear to independent journalism I have is that one day Facebook wakes up and decides it wants to be a media company or to be, you know, to practice journalism. Uh, and I don't think they will, because I think they're smart enough to realize journalism is the worst business that you could ever get into. <laughs> but uh, from a financial standpoint and every other standpoint. But uh, <laughs> 
but it is, it's important to know uh, that Twitter especially for journalists is like a terrible echo chamber and I'm, it's my favorite platform too, I love it, but it's just, it is. But it, everything can be a sinkhole. The story is what matters and then you use every tool at your disposal to get the story out to everybody you can. So we have just a minute. We're gonna take one other question and then we're gonna have to. Um, we kind of started a little bit late. Can we take that question? Yeah, <laughs> I think we have to leave it. Oh, Hi, um, my name's Gudrun go. Wilcox. I'm a fashion journalist and um, I'd love to study here. Um, I'm just intrigued. I hear a lot about um, quickness, uh, knowing about everything, being your own editor first time around is the like last draft and I can't help feeling like with the, with the growth of di digital journalism, the craft of journalism will be lost and I just wanted to find out what your perspective on this is. I would like to completely disagree with you. Oh, good. <laughs> um, a few months ago there was a discussion here actually about long form in the age of digital. And a lot of what we're talking about is essentially giving people who are way better at writing longer pieces and having edits the space to do that. Because at the company that I was at before, we talked about the concept of stock and flow, right? Flow is like the quick hits of things that people expect. It's like why you check your phone every five and a half seconds because you want something new all the time. And then the stock is like the ideas pieces and the longer things and the investigations that people had to pick up multiple phones multiple times and call lots of people to put those things together. And one of the fantastic things about digital is that it has given more of those kinds of stories a much longer shelf life than ever before. You know, like my favorite example is like the New Yorker dropped its paywall for two months and suddenly everybody was better read than they'd ever been <laughs> and could make much better dinner party conversation um, because they'd all been reading deeply reported, beautifully written pieces. And I don't think that these things are in competition. I think we as journalists have this tendency to sometimes patronize our audiences and act like they will only want the quick hits of things. But you know, again, like looking at our analytics, people read. You know, they read on mobile, they go through the stories, and like Kevin is like the master of the blog post talking about like the the kinds of the extremes of where people pay attention and basically you just don't want to be in the middle and really boring. But the quick hits do super well and the long form does super well. Basically, yeah, basically the middle falls away. The undistinguished yeah. middle length post that isn't focused and shareable. But the things that are fast and creative and, and focused and the things that are longer where there's a more where there's a payoff for the reader in terms of analysis, narrative. I think that's a that's a good uh, rule for digital anything, but certainly digital media is that the middle always falls away. Yeah. yeah. Like there, there will be more space for long. It's like it's not long tail, but it's like there's more <laughs> space for longer in-depth things, and there's it's easier for those really rich pieces of media or things that had a lot of time sunk into them to get to the audience that they should be in front of because yeah. they can last forever. Uh, but yeah, the middle the middle goes away. And I mean, I we see it in our organization. Uh, again, we're aggregation and op-ed. We're not, we're not a traditional, we're, the way we do it is not how every news organization <laughs> should do it. Uh, but what we find as we've grown, as we've gone from, you know, eight individual bloggers to 150 plus people, is that those, uh, we just look for people that know how to package a story. And sometimes that means a really sweet gif. And sometimes that means a uh, hundred perfect words and a great headline. And sometimes it means 7,000 words and it takes them a week and a half to do it. And a lot of what I do as editorial director is try to make sure that everybody is using the right form for the right story. And if they're doing that, then I create the space for them to do it. So, yeah. yeah, I'm not I'm not too worried about it. And I also think too, it's, you know, I spend a lot of time. There's a couple of really great Twitter feeds that have like just like headlines from 100 years ago or like little clips from 100. It's so valuable to like re realize that most journalism and most like most media has been garbage always, always. forever. <laughs> it's always been dicks. Like it's just what it is. We're part of a long tradition of dicks. Like it's it's okay. Speak for yourself. Yeah. So Sheila, do we, do you have a last question? Or? Yes, actually, I wanted you to answer some of those questions. It's unfair that yeah. you're the moderator. We don't <laughs> yeah, get ahead. you to answer. So so the, our panelists have said, you know, what dis distinguishes digital journalism from just journalism is speed, interactivity, the voices, that the packaging. So, so is there is there anything else? That's my question. From your experience in Quartz, you know, what is yeah. what makes Quartz distinct and different from, from the rest of those out there? And secondly, the, the global audience. You know, your thoughts on that. Is it the same as the American audience no. in terms of reaching out <laughs> yeah. and engaging and, and all of that? This is like, I have like a 20 minute answer to this <laughs> because this is kind of what we do every day. But we can get your strategy <laughs> with numbers. But um, just the, the 60 second version to the first thing is that 
when you're when you're digital only a lot of stuff falls away that you realize is vestiges of a early 20th century manufacturing process that you're not constrained by anymore and that uh, to write successfully for people on the web and to do great journalism you can just leave that behind and the example of this there are two examples one is journalists traditionally did not write their own headlines and part of that is because as part of the manufacturing process the only person who could write the headline was the person who was who was literally putting the type on the plate the metal plate and knew how many characters they had well, it turns out that when you ask journalists to write their own headline, the actual reporter themselves, they write great headlines, and it's a very focusing um, activity to actually be sure that they understand what they're, what they're writing. The other, the other example is just the form of the article, the standard unit of production of a, of a traditional news organization is a 750-word article. And that's partly because on newspaper, sheets of newspaper or in a wire service, that's sort of the, the units of composition of, of a page. It turns out, you know, as we've been saying, that people read short stuff and they read long stuff, and that standard unit of production is actually not, not what people want to read or most people want to read online. So that's sort of, um, in terms of how we think of digitally native things, it's actually pretty libera liberating yeah. journalistically. But you have to either untrain yourself or, or if, you, if you have been a print journalist like a lot of us, or you have to go in feeling confident that you, um, you know, with these different formats and, and uh, to leave them. And then the second, your second question was around um, international readership. And um, Quartz has close to half of its readership outside of the US. And um, I think part of it is what you write about. So we've tried to let our content flow out without any friction on social networks. We haven't done any. Uh, marketing or anything significant outside of the U.S. We do have a, a young India edition with a few journalists there, but the core of it is there is actually a global readership for the right sort of things. There may not be a global readership for for municipal New York elections, but it, but if you're if you have a story that's both important and interesting, there's likely a, a readership around the. I'm going for it. I, I would just throw in the Rob Ford you know, story, <laughs> yeah. right? Which, which like, is a municipal story, actually. Yeah, which is a but but it but it not to disagree with you, but to to prove that out. It's yeah. it's uh, if you just cover the things that seem to make sense, the mar the audience will share. We'll it for find you. it. Yeah, yeah every you know, story it, finds its readership yeah. somehow. So yeah. Just okay. on, um, on global audiences, like we are a global newspaper that happens to be, a global media organization that happens to be headquartered in London, but I've worked in both places a lot. And to extremely stereotype, Americans generally don't like reading about things that are not relevant to the US directly, immediately, unless they have to. And the rest of the world is also less interested in the US than you might think, so. Yeah. <laughs> all right, on that note. So, Sheila, are we all set? Any more questions for, for the? crowd. Okay, we're going to let everybody go. Thank you for staying here. We hope this is a Thank you Stacy, Joel and Mitra.